thank you and we honor you for teaching us, God, how to make the right decisions about our lives. So much to allure us, so much to attract us. We thank you, God, that you gave us Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we learn not to settle just for the gift, but we can have the giver. And Father, now as I stand to proclaim your word, I seek for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Speak to me and speak through me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh. And we ask this in the master's mighty and marvelous name of your son, Jesus. We thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. I invite you to turn with us this morning to the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. And to these younger graduates, even to the older ones, in life you're going to be called upon to make a lot of decisions. Some of them will be personal. They'll be applicable to you and you alone. You'll be called upon to make some social decisions. Um, who are you going, what friends you're going to have, uh, get to college, what sorority or what fraternity you're going to be a part of, social decisions. You're going to be called upon to make some career decisions, and even before then, you're going to be have called upon to make some job decisions. Now, I do want you to notice the difference between a job and a career. A job is what you get when you finish college to start paying off your student loans. Amen. That's a job. You need that. It may not be your career. It may not be where you end up, but it will, in fact, suffice for the time being. You're going to make some financial decisions. You're not going to try and get the car that somebody else got. You're going to get the car that you can afford. Decisions. Even if you're over 18, you're going to make some political decisions. Who to vote for, what to vote for, and what to vote against all part of the decisions. And there are a number of factors that go into decision making. One of them is appearance. We make decisions on the basis of the way things look. That's, that's a common way we decide. Or we make decisions on the basis of past experience, things that we've already gone through in life, or things that somebody else went through that we learned from. We make decisions on the basis of desire, what I want, what my own preferences are. We make decisions on the basis of cognitive bias, what I prefer over something else. We make decisions on the basis of learned behavior. Uh, I learned the last time I did this, I got in trouble, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Mom and Daddy said be home at 11. I got home at 11.05. What's the big deal? Five minutes is the big deal. And so you learn that it's important to be there at 1059. Amen. We learn from personal relevance. What is really important to me? What's relevant to me? We learn even from our age, how old we are. We, we learn how to make decisions. Or, and, and our decisions, hopefully, prayerfully, improve over time. I want you to imagine with me a child being offered three quarters or one silver dollar. Three quarters or one silver dollar. And as a child, not knowing the value of the silver dollar, I choose the three because I've been taught three is greater than one. And so in making my decision, nine times out of ten, that child will choose the three quarters over the silver dollar. But then let's, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. I have two silver dollars. One is old and oxidated, and you could hardly read it, and the other is shiny and new. Which one do I choose? Preference would be I would choose the one that's shiny and new. But nobody told me that the old oxidated dollar was a 1795 silver dollar with the flowing hair. Now, I didn't have to be a numinous to know that the silver dollar with the flowing hair 
is worth more than the Ike silver dollar in 1970. But unless I understood value, then I will make the wrong decision. Understanding those factors is what helps influence our decision-making process. And th listen, there are some things that we know now, if we would have known them then, all of our lives would be different. I did not value what I know now. I did not value then what I know now. And that's what our lesson is about today, understanding the factors that influence the process of making value decisions. Are you looking at Mark chapter 8, verse number 34? When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Our central thought has come out of verses 36 and 37. For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I want to talk from the subject, an unsound exchange, an unsound exchange. I was dialoguing once with a medical professional, and we were talking about the mission of the emergency room. And in the declaration, he declared, the hospital does not take care of health. The hospital takes care of illness. Listen carefully. He says, therefore, the emergency room is there to give assurance and assistance to the afflicted. The hospital, from what I surmise from his saying, is that its primary mission is health restoration, not health care. I know this sounds foreign. Just listen. This is a professional saying it. It's not health care. It's health restoration. In fact, it was informed, I was informed that eight out of 10 people that come to the emergency room really leave out being told, you okay, things are not as bad as you think. And that suffices because their conditions are not that serious. You see, they're there to help us feel assured that we're not going to get any worse than we are. And there's great hope that we're going to get better. Having a clarity then of our mission, of our purpose, of why we exist is essential if we're going to understand the eternal purpose of God. There must be clarity of what God wants us to be and to do. And whenever that becomes muddied or muddled by so many extenuating circumstances, it takes us to a place where we may end up making wrong decisions because we are not operating according to the rule of God. Further, I would add to you, never subordinate or measure the mission on the volume of the gain. Too often in this Western world, everything has to be measured and more seems to be better, except when I'm told by Jesus that broad is the way that leads to destruction, that's more. But if only a few find their way to heaven, that's less. You can't measure the success of a ministry. You can't measure it by how many members are there. You can't measure it by how many choirs you got. You can't measure it by how many vans you own. You can't measure it by how much property you own. You can't measure it by any of that. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a church, people without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming back to measure us 
on our accomplishments. He's going to come back and measure us on our faithfulness. And so when we understand then that whenever we find any opportunity that arises that threaten the integrity, as Sister, Je Je uh, Je 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 uh, Sister Winston told us this morning, that if we find something that compromises, that, 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 that uh, compromises the integrity of what we believe, we need to turn from that. Because there's a very good chance it's going to draw you away from God. In our sermon, in this, in this, in this outline of where we're going today, that there's, there's what is known homiletically as the contextual prologue. And in the contextual prologue, some things have happened that brought Jesus to this place where he's talking. First of all, uh, Jesus had said to them, and it's the same text you find in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus had said to them, who do people say that I, the son of man, am? Y'all know about that, right? And, and, and they started Jeremiah, and they started naming people. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter declared, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And the Bible says, Jesus, Peter, I'm, pr I'm proud of you, but flesh and blood, you didn't do that by yourself. And that was revealed unto you by the power of God. That's in the contextual prologue. In that contextual prologue, Jesus makes the first announcement of his having to die and suffer and be crucified. And when he made that declaration, Peter stepped up and said, no way am I going to let that happen. I'm going to stand with you. If I have to die, I'll fight with you. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, some of you are saying that's kind of cold because Peter was trying to show his devotion and he was trying to show that I'm your guy, I'm your ride and die. And, and, and so why did Jesus treat him like that? In the contextual prologue, he rebuked Peter because Peter's intent was contrary to the divine intent. God purposed that Jesus was going to Calvary. Let me say it differently so you can grab it. There's some stuff that we go through in life that God allows us to go through it because God is growing us up. Some things we would never learn if we had not gone through that. But because of that, we stand firm now. We stand strong now. We stand with confidence now that our God is able. So he rebuked him. Now, to be sure, to be clear, Peter's thoughts were born out of concern. They were born out of fear. When Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, Peter was not uh, uh, indwelled by the devil. That's not what was happening. However, his dialogue had the tone and tint of satanic purpose. That is, Satan would have loved to have been able to stop Jesus from going to Calvary. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if he had have known that that would be the end result, he'd have stopped it. But he did not know. So, so Jesus, having had in the entire contextual prologue, he had compassion. In the text, chapter 8, uh, verses, uh, verses 1 down through 9, there, there was a situation where there were some folk that needed feeding. And Jesus fed them. He fed 4,000 people. This is not the same where he fed the 5,000 with the two fish and the five loaves. It's a different feeding. He fed 4,000 people because he had compassion on them. Three days they had been with him and had not eaten. He had compassion on them. He had concern for people because the concern lied in the fact of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Hypocrite, you know, when I hear people say, uh, the reason why I don't join the church is because there's too many hypocrites in there. Well, um, the, the problem is there are some in here, but everybody's not a hypocrite. Amen. Praise God. All of the good people should have said amen first. Um, everybody's not a hypocrite in the church. He had concern. He saw a condition that needed fixing. In the, epilogue, in, the, in the prologue, there was a man who was blind, and Jesus called him out from the crowd, put spit on his eyes, and he could see. Now, it was not complete yet because he saw men walking like trees. But in time, he could see that there's a condition that he fixed. And then we had the story of the crucifixion, that he was going to die. But here in our text today, 
he turns attention away from the compassion, having dealt with the concern and the condition and talked about crucifixion, he now in our text today focuses in on consecration. Let me make sure you understand where we're going. It is good to have compassion and help folk out. It's good to be in the feeding ministry. It's good to do whatever you can to help somebody in a time of need. It is good to have concern about the things that are important to God and stand firm on it. It's good to help people out of their conditions and be able to raise them up to a different level. What we need to understand is that we have to get to a place where we've consecrated ourselves to his service and his will, and it supersedes anything that we want. Now, this is where, this is where this gets real interesting because in, in the confines of this text, Jesus tells us some very important things, and I'm going through them quickly. First of all, he tells us, we become children of God by trusting and confessing to him that his son is our savior, we become his children. That's all we gotta do. Confess to Jesus that you want him Lord and Savior of your life. Confess your sins to him. Be honest with him if nobody else. And, you, and here's a marvel. For some of us, we recognize this. When we came, we, we had just stopped what we was doing last night. It was, it was just last night. So, some of us, it was early in the morning. It was early Sunday morning. We still got up and went to church, and God did something and turned our lives around. And yet he received us, still with the stench of our sin on us, he received us. We become children of God by trusting Christ for what he did on Calvary's cross. But secondly, we become disciples of God by surrendering our will to his will. And as we surrender, in fact, what Jesus says is, listen, if you live for yourself, you're going to lose your life. You, you, Christ is, is, is going to be ashamed of you if you live for yourself. But if you die to self and let God take control of your life, that's when you're going to start living. We become children by trusting. We become disciples by, by surrendering. But we become followers of Christ. As we go through our time and we start to feel, realize that we've got to make his mission our mission. This is key. Many people get involved in church work, have their own agendas as to why they do what they do. I want to claim. I want to be noticed. I want somebody to be happy with me. I want mama to be pleased with me. We do it for all kinds of reasons. The truth of the matter is, is that when we purpose to fulfill God's mission in our lives, and every one of us, God has a divine intent and purpose for us. And yours may not look like his or hers. Yours could be uniquely yours. God has that for us. So in our text, he gathers his disciples together. Look at the text. And along with the people who traveled with him to Caesarea Philippi. And when he gets there, the Bible says, he challenged that anybody who wants to follow me, who wanted to follow him, they have to redefine the cost of discipleship. If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to do an assessment. No longer will it suffice for any of us, even right now, to simply say we follow Jesus, read his word, come to church. That's not enough. It's not enough that you praise or that you preach or that you praise dance or you protect his property. That's not enough. Following Christ requires more. And Jesus says, from this time forward, I'm looking for a personal, passionate commitment that you're going to yield all of the worldly things that are going on and say, I'm going to put God first. Now, here's where, here's, here's where the problem is. Y'all probably don't remember. Sin is pleasurable. I, I didn't say that. The Bible said it. Rather, rather than, rather than 
uh, enjoy sin, Moses, uh, he, he left those things that was behind. We, we've got to decide, Hebrews chapter 11, read it. Uh, sin is pleasurable. You know how I know sin is pleasurable? Because you keep doing it. Who does anything that they don't like? We sin, enjoy it, and we do it again. Now, when we were growing up, when we were small, we were made to believe that if we sin, the earth would open up and swallow us, or the heavens would fall down on top of us, and life would be over. And after you did it one time, it wasn't even a rumble. You did it again. Nothing. Four years in now, nothing happened. Those church folks were lying to me. There's no consequences to the stuff I've been doing. They're just trying to take away my fun. They're just trying to hurt my enjoyment. No, well, I, I, I got bad news for you. It may not have fallen in yet. Hold on. Sooner or later, all that stuff that you, Will, 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 Wilbur Phillips and I were talking on Friday. We were, we were talking about all them hits we had playing football. You got hit from this side, hit from that side, knocked down, and, and you know you couldn't cry. Big boys don't cry. So you jump right back up like you ain't hurt. You go back in the huddle, and you're right. Yeah, 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 let's go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And, and you keep on going, keep on. Well, sometime around 64 and three months, you get up one morning and your foot decided don't want to work that morning. Those pains start hitting you. And you look, at there is a consequence. Sin may look like it's benign, but it is cancerous. Jesus says, you got to make a passionate commitment. And, and so he says, here's what he says. Selfish indulgence must be sacrifice. What pleases you if you really want to be a follower of Christ, you really got to sacrifice self-indulgence and make your sole purpose following the things of Christ. It is in our text. Look at what he says. He says, he says, he says, um, Mark 8, 31. He began to teach them. Y'all looking at it? Mark 8, 31. He says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, what he's saying to them as, as a backdrop, he told them that they had to take up their cross and follow him. That did not have any meaning until chapter 8, verse 31. It is there we begin to understand what he meant by taking up his cross because he was going to be crucified. And as he's explaining it to them, there's a paradoxical content to what he says. Because he says in the text, he, it is in the discourse, he says, if, verse 35, if you want to save your life, you got to lose your life. I don't, that's, that's, that's paradoxical. That, I, what do you mean if i got to save my life? I've got to lose it. Jesus says, if you truly want to follow me, listen, you've got to renounce that high value you have of yourself. You think you're all that. You, you think... If I don't preach this morning, ain't nobody going to preach. Bad, bad answer. Because God's got somebody sitting out there ready to say something that will change people's mind. If you don't preach, God's got his word. We'll go for it. If you won't sing, if you won't dance, if you won't do whatever, God's got somebody that will do it. But we ought to be happy that he let us do it anyhow. There are people that do what we do better than we do and have not even come forth yet. We ought to be glad God receives our meager offerings. He says you got to be willing to share the experience of cross-bearing. Listen, listen to all the graduates and everybody moving forward in life. There are some things that are going to face us. We'll start to understand what it means to bear the cross. We, we won't have to die on the cross as Jesus did. That was done already. But we got some cross-bearing ahead of us. 
And he says, you've got to be willing to bear your cross. If you let your lives go, he says, he says, you've got to insist on placing my idea of life ahead of your idea of life. Now, now come on here. Many of us desire to make our lives easier and better. It's not enough. Come on, some of y'all remember, remember when we had one TV in the house? And, and that one TV, had, the, the knobs broke, and we had to turn it with pliers. And, and the antennas broke off of it, and so we had a coat hanger up on it. One TV in the whole house. Now we got one in the kitchen, so that when we're cooking, we can watch. We got one in the bathroom, so when we're shaving, we can watch. We got one in every room of the house. We got a TV. Come on, remember where God brought you from. We seek for life to be easier and more enjoyable. We want better paying jobs. It's good to have a job. I just want a better paying job. I, my house is all right. I want a bigger house. I, my car's okay. I just want a newer car. My, 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 my claim is all right. People know me, but I want to be known more than I'm known right now. Look at the text. The text says, Jesus says, in order to really live that life you want to live, you got to come to the end of your self-centered existence. Turn your life over to him and follow him. Now, now, he urged him. He urged his audience. Forget about human existence as being smooth. So I'm going to tell you right now. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how good you are. There's going to be some hiccups at your job. There's going to be some stuff that happens where you're going to know that everybody, you know, even working in the church, never mind. Um, <laughs> you, you're going to find out that everybody at your job is not your friend. They go away on vacation, come back with all their pictures. You come back with your vacation pictures, and they don't even want to see them. And you're wondering, what did I do to them? Nothing. They just expect for their lives to be greater than yours. You tell them about how you had your graduation and how you family took you out to dinner and you had flowers. That, they don't care. They want to come and show you their child graduated in grammar school and they have a whole portfolio of pictures. Somebody just said he's making that personal. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Paul says, to truly know Christ, it means letting go of your past and throwing all your boasting onto the garbage heap along with all the other dung. That's what he says. He, he, says, he says that the reason I'm going to do that is so that I'm enriched and who Christ is in my life, more than being enriched in who I think I am. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, born from the tribe of Benjamin. I know my pedigree, but pedigree don't matter when you come into the service of God. Well, then, then Jesus brings us to this value comparison. Y'all stand with me. Verse 36. What good, he says, does it do for people to win the whole world, and yet lose their souls. What, what, one translation, what profit is there? What benefit is there? Which one do you think provides the greatest gain? The world or your soul? That's an interesting question. Is that... Am I asking myself, is there an advantage to keeping hold of my soul as opposed to receiving the things of the world? Could I share something with you this morning, graduates? The stakes are very high in the game of life. There is an enemy that wants to steal the joy of who you are. 
He wants to pilfer the pride that God has in you when you look like one of his children. Jesus was teaching there is a consequence to self-centered living. When the only one that is really happy about you is you. The content, the constant pursuit of personal gain is something that our, our nation is teaching. It's something that we're going after. And, and, and Jesus says, whenever you try and control the circumstance, you forget I'm controlling the world that your circumstance is in. So while you're trying to fix that little thing, you'll find out that you're impoverished in spirit. You'll find out that you're bereft of joy. You'll find out that your life is not what you thought it would be. Happiness is not there. Bitterness and, and depression is your consequence because you have not placed me first in your life. Jesus said it be known that the ending of every person's life is rendered useless despite all of our frantic efforts. The harder you try to make yourself something, it seems like the worst things are getting for you. And that's because you didn't put Christ first. Come on, we're, com we're coming to the close. So consider, if we gotta put Christ first, I gotta make sure that my mind doesn't look to satisfy me and my stuff. Jesus tells a, an account in Luke chapter 12 of a man who was rich. He had so much stuff, he said, you know what? I don't have no place to put all this stuff. I got to build me some bigger barns. Y'all know the story, right? I got to build some bigger barns because I'm, I'm getting all this extra crop in and I need some. Jesus said to him, you fool. <laughs> That's the strength. You fool, Jesus says. God said to him, I will demand your life from you tonight. And after you leave tonight, who's going to get all that stuff that you've been accumulating? You're not going to take it with you. That's how it is when you've, after material riches, uh, Maslow, and for those who've gone to school, Maslow's hierarchy of need says that once you've actualized, self-actualized at the top of the pyramid, that you're no longer motivated by stuff. You're not motivated by money. You're not motivated by position. At the bottom of the pyramid, you may need that, but at the top, you don't need it. So how do I get to the top of the pyramid? I decided some years ago that I would like to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, which takes me to the top of the pyramid. There's, 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 there's no comparison. There's no comparison on the balance sheet. Listen, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? So here's what he says. One soul is more valuable than the whole world. One, what, what are you profit a man? What can it, and then what will a man give in exchange for his soul. Now, uh, how many people you know collect souls? Anybody know any soul collectors? So even if I offered my soul, the world wouldn't want my soul because what's a soul worth? There's only one person that collects souls, and his name is Jesus. Jesus cares about your soul. What will I exchange for my soul? What price will I place on my immortality by yielding up my soul just to get stuff or a claim or a name? And there's nothing worth it, beloved. There is absolutely nothing that can equate to the value of your soul. Because when you lose the importance of who you are, that's what the soul is, the real essence of who you are. When you lose the real importance of the essence of who you are, it's a downward slope. Life gets worse day by day. So, so very quickly, very quickly, look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, Jesus says, the, and he opened this whole discourse with the cost of discipleship. But he ends it 
with the judgment for those who do not follow him. He says, if you don't even understand the value of your soul, and it'll bring you to a place, watch now, where you'll start to compromise, giving up what's really important for what's not important. And if you are ashamed to own me before men, then I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. You choose. So the matter wherein we follow him is we must follow his holy doctrine. What God, Jesus says in his word, God declares to us in the Bible, we've got to believe that what God said is true. The holy doctrine of God. We've got to determine that we want to live a holy life. And, and you don't have to live long enough. First of all, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, testify. If the Holy Spirit is inside of you, when you do wrong, the Spirit of God lets you know. Testify. That God's Spirit says, that's not right. The matter in which we follow him. There are things in which we follow him. We follow him by, not, you know, nowhere did Jesus want to be lifted up and praised, even though he deserved all the glory and all the praise. We follow him in our humility. He subordinated his will to the will of the Father. He said, not my will, but your will be done. Daily he was in prayer, not just when he was in trouble. You've got, in fact, he's trusted God for his daily substance. Give us this day our daily bread. He had a fervent zeal for the house of God. If there's anything, if there's anything, I, heard, I saw something on, uh, on Instagram, and I, I know it's true, that, that, that there's people who are coming to church now don't know church like you and I do. They don't honor the things that you and I honor. Remember when you were afraid to walk by the communion table? You would never think about laying something on the communion table. Never. And now we've lost the sanctity of the house of God. And the stuff that we do in the world, the same competitiveness, the same desire to push ahead, we find it in the church just like we find it in the world. We need to follow him in his faith and his confidence. He knew that his father had him. We need to follow him in his charity and his love toward mankind. The manner in which the matter of our trust in him is living like Jesus. But then the manner in which we trust him, follow him, is we've got to follow him in faith. We've got to believe that God has everything good in store for us. Every good and perfect gift comes down from God. He's got good stuff in store for us. We've got to follow him in our affection that we have one for another. Anybody with two feet in skin, somebody has hurt your feelings. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. And it won't be the last time. You're going to get your feelings hurt again. Somebody's going to talk about you again. Somebody's going to say something about you. And don't let what people say turn your life away from God. Trust God. The motivation to follow him is in the, in the equity of the precept. What will a man profit? to gain the whole world. Three quarters or one silver dollar. Which one do I value more? Well, as I got older, I recognized that there are four quarters in this silver dollar. Even though it looks like more is over here, this is worth more. I used to, uh, the kids at Jericho, if they bring me their report cards to read, I would give them a gold dollar. Four marking periods, I had students that had four gold dollars. I was told at the bank they were running out of them and I, that the supply was getting very short. So I went to several of them and said, I tell you what, give me those four gold dollars back and I'll give you a five dollar bill. 
you know. I said, you got $4, and I'm going to give you $5. They said, no, no, no. Th these, these gold dollars are worth more to us than that piece of paper because you gave those to us to acknowledge who we are. And I got 11 of them already. When the value is there, when you value what God values, there is no exchange. I value my soul because God values my soul. And I will not give it up for anything because there's nothing worth the sanctity and the integrity of my soul.